It does seem interesting, doesn't it, that will we look back on these last two or three years and think we are living through some kind of golden age of poetry in this country and in Europe and in America and all over the world. And it does seem to me that, and it's partly because I'm in the middle of it and I'm reading and writing poems all the time, but it does seem to me that we are in the middle of some kind of renaissance, if you don't want to use that word stupidly. We are, use, we are in the middle of a lot of poems, a lot of very good poems being written, as we'll see, as we're seeing tonight. Uh, the epigraph, one of the epigraphs, one of the poems in Tracy Hurd's fantastic book goes, Doctor, when am I most real? And this moving and superb book asks that question over and over again. When am I most real? There aren't any definite answers in the book, but often the possibilities are seen through the prism, the endless prism of popular culture and films and music. There's the big bopper in here, and there's James Dean, Louise Brooks, Buddy Holly, images and sounds that anyway pervade our lives and give us boundaries and rhythms to live by. There are poems of anguish in here and loneliness, but they are pervaded with the power, I think, of language to heal and renew. In one of her poems called The Afternoon Shift to Leaving Port Talbot Steelworks, she finishes with the lines, one by one the anonymous men are slipping away. And I think Tracy's mission in this book is to make none of us anonymous, to make us all somebody. By reading her poems, we can become somebody. So the epigraph becomes more real. Doctor, when am I most real? And I think the answer is we are most real when we're reading poems like Tracy Hurd's. Tracy. Hall of Mirrors. His gallery was a hall of mirrors. I floated its length like a lone black swan, its half open eyes taking nothing in, for blank was my image in his mirror. Each day I died, stripping my flesh from bone, begging his skillful hands to make me come alive again. I wanted him to take me home but he betrayed me with my silent twin. I was his graceless, heartless mannequin, lovingly gifted into another. He gave her lips in warm, breathing color. When the paint had died, he touched her skin. Um, this poem is for my best friend's daughter, Elsie, who's just turned 18, and she's wonderful, and it's called Dreams of Lost Summers and Found Lines. Grandma will take us rowing on the lake, you texted me, and I was fooled into thinking it real, as if you were still a little girl. It won't ever happen. You passed each other briefly, six weeks on this earth together. She is 16 summers away. When was the last time we took the rowboat out? Last century, all these missing years. It was a scorching summer. We were all burned, sprawled on the grass by the water's edge awaiting our half-lifetime on the water. Sometimes I smell roses in her bedroom or parma violets when I'm drifting off. She spent her last years in this bed reading old green and cream penguin novels addicted to her detective stories. In the evening, she enjoyed a small sherry. If only the dark amber liquid could have better preserved the memories. Now lying quietly beneath an oak tree, does she hear the little blonde girl, grown up now, playing her viola, the sweet note perfect recital, floating through the warm summer air, always a dreamer, a part of her music.
happy birthday. It would have been your birthday today. The Furies found me and brought me a cake and lit the candles with their fiery breath. The heat is intolerable. Perhaps this is what it is like to be in hell. You'll never blow them out. I didn't allow you even one breath. Their eyes are dripping blood, as I did. The nurses told me to keep my eyes shut. Well, you were just a random selection of cells, nothing like me at all. I still wanted to see you, my little bloody paperweight. Could I have counted your toes and fingers, seen ancestors in your tiny face? The drugs made me float like a sunset above my aching body. By the 22nd week, the eyes have formed, but the irises still lack pigment and are shut. Every month, I lie like a broken mannequin on the bed. There is a fist or a heart in my stomach, and the furies are here to remind me I am empty. Although there's no need, I know why I bleed. You were scraped away like unwanted food. Look at you lying there in your little glass coffin. Or is it a snow globe? Were you terribly cold? Will I sprinkle your cradle with snow? Will you wake in 100 years and see my face in the mirror and shudder? Will the trees have grown up to the skies? The briars and roses climbing your stone wall? The prince pulling on his white horse, the rope pulling tighter. He will never have any intention of rescuing you in your bloody shift with your blind eyes. Um, the last um, three poems are a sequence about the deaths of Buddy Holly, um, the big bopper, Richie Valens, and their pilot, Roger Peterson, in 1959. Don McLean wrote a song about it called The Day the Music Died. Near Clear Lake, Idaho. In the drifting, swirling snow, the ground above, the sky below, this is where God made you disappear from all earthly radar. We belong together for all eternity. This will be the day we say goodbye. This will be the day we die. Honey, that clock looks so lonely as the tears run down its face. But let's find a better memory of Chantilly lace and a pretty face and a ponytail hanging down. Oh, baby, you know what I like. Five seconds. Funny how five seconds... Never mind, enough to remember that perfectly ordinary coin pulled still warm from Alsop's pocket, the horse command to call, a quarter flipped into the freezing air as both men puffed clouds of steam and rubbed cold hands together. How could you have known as a coin spun that you were flipping between life and death, death and life, life and death? One man had to lose. The coin fell and you both bent down. The stories differ, but I think it was heads. So Richie went to retrieve his overnight bag from the freezing coach, marvelling at his good luck. While Clear Lake sleeps, one man paces his room, convinced that he watched the taillights of his beach water bonanza dip then disappear. It was simply his imagination, his companion said, but he knew. He will phone Fargo, North Dakota, many times that snow-choked night to see if they checked in. They will never check in. They lie broken in the snow, soft flurries drifting over their bodies, curtains of snow, but no last encore. The big bopper sang of having no coat for his back or no shoes for his feet. The crash which flung him over 40 feet on a fence told the clothes from his body. The angels must have had that night off 
although he swore that someone's watching over you tonight. He'll watch you as you rest your head. To Buddy, it really doesn't matter anymore, but rave on anyway if you can. Richie, only 17, impatient, come on, let's go. The Music Men. Out into the dark, star-laden night, the snow piling up like gambling chips all over the state. Was God licking his lips? Here the weather is freezing, but no snow as yet, just frost and chill. At one o'clock on February the 3rd, a small plane takes off from Mason City, Iowa. It doesn't have very far to go, but nobody knows that God has orchestrated wind shear and a horizontal snow for just after takeoff. The warning from the tower goes unheard. A wing scrapes snow from the roof of a house and spins as God shakes the world, or just an isolated cornfield in Iowa. You wouldn't have known much beyond the snow as the plane crumples into a fence like paper. How many songs were lost as four men turned to ghosts. There was a show called The Music Men playing nearby. You just dropped in. The following morning, acres of snow and curtains pulled back. He takes a plane along the same route as last night and sees something in a field that his co-pilot swears blind as a hog house. They land, the night wind still howling tunelessly. There will be no new stars in the sky. This is the graveyard of broken men, where they will always remain, amidst each winter's tumble of snow, beside the metal guitar and inscribed silver discs. Buddy's horn-rimmed glasses. Dr. T.J. Ecklenberg looks over a different landscape of isolation in more sober frames. Yet the end result is still the same. That pilgrimage back into the past. Thank you.